Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, or good evening, whatever time of the day it is for you. Um, this is a video that where we review everything that we've done so far in English language in the lockdown period. And we then have a think about uh, English language work that we're doing in year two. And we set you up with some work that you ought to be doing over the summer. OK, so you might want to get a piece of paper and just throw down from memory what are the three main areas that we have been concentrating on over the last three months in English language. OK, and so here we are. So the first thing that we did when we were all disappearing off home around about March the 19th, the 20th, was we were polishing off the language diversity topic of language and gender. So we were looking at concepts like semantic derogation. Uh, we were looking at uh, gender free pronouns. We were asking the question, to what extent does the English language have a problem in terms of gender bias? those sorts of issues. So we did a week or so about that. And depending whose group you were in, we also did a little bit about language and sexuality as well. So in particular, we looked at Polari, uh, about which there's quite a lot in the textbook on page 185 to 186. And that set us up for the, uh, the end, of, end of that term and the beginning of the Easter break. We then came back and we spent the whole of the first half of the summer term being persuasive, i.e. preparing for that original writing, non-exam assessment. Um, okay, and so that kept us happy for five or six weeks. Uh, and at the end of that process, you should have drafted, redrafted and submitted your persuasive article, uh, drafted, redrafted and submitted a commentary, uh, produced an annotated style model, and also uh, a list of sources, a bibliography too. Um, so there are still a few of you who have lagged behind on that and have not completed, for example, a, a redrafted commentary. You certainly need to get on with that. You need to have that done and dusted by the end of this term. You don't want this to be spilling over into the holiday and going over into next term, because believe me, in next term, there's plenty of stuff for, for us to be doing, new material, and you can't have this old stuff lagging over. Okay, so make sure that you're in touch with your teacher. Please get those things sorted out. It's 10% of your overall assessment. Remember, of course, that if it all ends up as a complete disaster, this piece, it may not be the end of the world because uh, you've done a short story and a commentary in, in term one. And at the end of the day, it may be that one that we put in rather than the persuasive article. OK, so really make sure that that piece is in. So having done all of that, then the final thing that we've been doing since June the 1st is discourses. And this is important because it's 30% of your overall assessment. So it's worth three times more than what we were doing on persuasion. And uh, we've been reading all sorts of articles, haven't we, where journalists have been commenting upon language features and you've been asked to analyze and compare the way that they use language in order to present ideas. So we've been thinking a lot about prescriptivism versus descriptivism. We've been looking at the kind of metaphors and semantic fields that writers use in order to produce discourses. Uh, and we've been using our language levels as usual. OK, and then finally, as part of that process, we've been producing some kind of uh, opinion articles as well, uh, using our AO2 knowledge. OK, so again, if you've got behind on that, the key thing to do is go back to Google Classroom and in a very, very structured way, try and go back through and make sure that you've completed all of those tasks that are there. OK, right. So let's now have a think about uh, the second year. The second year is great. I mean, students usually say, well, I've enjoyed the first year, but the second year is somehow more meaty and substantial. Certainly there's more knowledge, there's more information that you need to know, and they're really, really interesting subjects. So what have we got to do in the second year? Again, I would advise you to pause the video there and throw down on a piece of paper what you think there is yet to do still on the course. And so let me talk you through them. 
So when we come back on, uh, let's just reduce the size of my head here so you can see that cartoon for a second. There you go. Uh, when we come back on August the whatever it is, August the 17th, which is like two and a half weeks before the schools go back, then we will get st stuck straight away into good old CLD, Children's Language Development. And it's the speech aspect of CLD that we will be looking at. So it's this everyday miracle of how human beings acquire language in the first years of their life. And it's a fascinating subject. Um, it has all kinds of links with psychology. So if you look at some of the theories that we've got there, psychologists, you will recognize some of these things, like, for example, behaviorism, which is the simple idea that a, an American psychologist called B.F. Skinner propounded, that basically children learn simply, learn language simply through imitation. So they hear their parents and those around them saying things, uh, constructing syntax and using certain accent features, and all that they do is imitate. So it's basically a straightforward copying process. Along comes people like the American psychologist Noam Chomsky, and he says, well, that's a gross simplification of what goes on. And actually, it's not right, because children have some kind of inbuilt mechanism, uh, a kind of innate language instinct, which means that whatever language is going on around them, without any lessons that are being taught to them, within three or four years, provided they've got kind of like normal processes of language development going on, they are going to acquire language, right? And that's why children say things like sheeps, like that, or they say things like, Daddy, I eated my breakfast. So sheeps and eated my breakfast are great examples of what Chomsky would call uh, virtuous errors. I, uh, the sorts of things that children are not hearing adults say. No adult would say sheeps or eat it. So what must be going on there is the child is <clears throat> formulating a kind of hypothesis of how language works. And in a creative way, what they're doing is they're working out the, the syntax and morphology of the language. Okay, so we've got that whole debate between nativism, which is what I've just described there, i.e. that children have this native propensity for language, and behaviorism. We've got other theories going on. We've got cognitive theory, which was developed by somebody called uh, Jean Piaget. And this is the idea that you're that language is not a kind of discrete skill in itself, that basically it's very, very linked into your cognitive development, i.e. the development of your mental thinking processes. So we look at that, we look at things like CDS, don't we? Which is that funny social act that we all seem to adopt when we talk with children. Uh, so we look to see whether that's a universal feature. And we try to think, why is it that instinctively parents tend to do this, tend to use CDS? Um, and we look at things like functional theory, which was developed by a theorist called Michael Halliday, who says, look, the important thing when you're looking at children's language is to look at what children are trying to do with their language, i.e. the purposes and the functions behind the language. And we've even got this Russian uh, linguist called Vygotsky, who comes up with his zone of proximal development. So as you can see there, this underlines the fact that when you're in the second year, there is actually a whole load of knowledge that you need to be demonstrating. There's a lot of information. Uh, it's a great area for many students. It's kind of like their, their most favorite part of the course. And we do that for something like six weeks and it's in preparation for your English paper one section B, where you have to write an essay, an hour long essay about a CLD issue. Okay, so that keeps us going for the first part of uh, the term. Um, but we haven't finished with children yet, because then we go into reading and writing. So this is CLD, but literacy. Okay. Uh, and on this bit, we're looking at these sorts of things. You will be pleased to know that there's a whole lot of more theorists that you'll have to learn. So people like Barry Kroll, who comes up with four different stages of children's writing. 
concepts like emergent writing, which is the idea that, well, it's trying to destroy that kind of stereotype that children know nothing about literacy for the first kind of four years of their life and they get sent off to school and that's when the process of reading and writing begins. And recent research has seemed to show, well, that's, that's nonsense. There's a whole load of reading and writing skills that are developing in a child at two and three and four years old. So you can kind of look at three-year-old scribbles on pieces of paper and can see the beginnings of their literacy development. So that's called emergent writing. Uh, we look at the work of uh, Jean Chow, who uh, claims that there are different uh, reading stages, that it's not just kind of like a random development, but children tend to go through these predictable stages of reading. We have a think about phonics and how jolly is phonics. And we look at the different kinds of uh, phonics that are used in teaching. And we compare phonics teaching with kind of like whole word teaching, where a child is shown an entire word and is just asked to say it out aloud. So we look at the, the benefits and the limitations of different methods of teaching literacy. And uh, we look at spelling. So how children develop in their spelling over time. Again, the strategies that teachers use and the stages that they go through. And we also look at the genres that children are expected to be producing in primary school. Uh, and we look at the work of uh, an Australian researcher called Jean Rothery. So as you can see, there's plenty of names of theorists there, and it's really, really interesting stuff. Um, those of you who are perhaps contemplating becoming primary school teachers, this is a really, really important part of the course. So uh, we actually get it, even though there's a lot of stuff to do there, we actually get through that quite quickly. We spend something like four weeks doing it. Okay, so we get to half term and we've covered the whole of CLD. We are then into November and December. We're in the back end of autumn. It's getting cold and dark and we need something to lift our spirits. So along comes this thing. It's the language investigation. For many students, this is a great part of the course. This is a 2000 word project, an independent project that you do on some aspect of language that really floats your boat. Um, so what you do is you have an idea for uh, an investigation. You go off and you grab a whole load of interesting data, which may be written data, it might be spoken data, it might be kind of mixed mode. Uh, the data might be primary data, where you know it's never been collected before, like you're recording people, or it could be secondary data where you're taking the data from another source. And what you do is you put the data together, you construct a methodology and you do a full scale analysis of the language in which you're trying to answer a question that you've posed of it. So it's a great part of the course. And the wonderful thing about it is that uh, the lessons are completely different. So it's no longer a teacher standing at the front of the class telling you stuff and it's you working independently on things. And we as teachers and tutors sitting alongside you and looking at the work that you're doing and trying to nudge you in the right direction. Now, what are the sorts of things that you can do on a language investigation? Here, I've just put down some of the things that some of our students were doing last year. Can you imagine spending two months immersed in Donald Trump's tweets? Yeah, well, that's what some of our students did. So you could do things like that because what, what you're looking at there is language and technology and this new kind of social act that's based around this new technological development. So um, that's an interesting area to look at. You could take a reality TV program, like your favorite and my favorite, Love Island. And what you could do is you could transcribe bits of the conversations that are going on in this reality TV program, and you could apply gender theory. So you could look at, for example, uh, Deborah Tannen's claims in the 1990s that males and females actually use language in different ways for different purposes. And you could apply that to the transcript to see whether that actually holds true. Uh, you could do a piece that's basically about uh, the history of English and how it's changed over time. So you could take, for example, the first verses of the Bible 
and you could take the uh, 1611 King James Bible version and the 1970s Good News Bible and another version from the 19th century and you could look at the differences between them and try and think well how and why are these versions of language different you could uh, go off and collect some talk uh, so you might for example take occupational talk like teacher talk in the classroom and you might be taping a teacher like me for example in the classroom and looking to see for example to what extent i use language in different ways depending on the classes that i'm teaching or you could do a comparison between different teachers and the way that they use language in order to exert power etc etc you could go to secondary data like for example the educating manchester or educating uh, yorkshire sessions and then you could transcribe bits from those to look at the language of the teachers or the students for example um maybe you're interested in cars uh, this is something that one of my students did uh, last year he's going on to be a, a journalist where he wants to specifically look at the world of motoring uh, work in the world of motoring so he looked at porsches i think it was and how they've changed in their nature over time from the 1950s and 1970s and 1990s. Um, that's a fascinating area. You could uh, collect some data looking at a particular age group, like teenagers, and a particular geographical area, like Teesside, and you could do some kind of investigation into kind of like the accent and dialect features that are going on in that particular area. The world is your omelette. Yeah, so over the next three or four months, just keep your mind open on this. And whenever you come across an interesting area that makes you think, hmm, then make a note of it, because it could well be that it turns into a fantastic language investigation. So you're going to be doing that over November and December, and you're going to be submitting that in January. And so that's 10% of your overall A level. I, it's worth the same amount as one of your original writing pieces. Okay. Now, so when we come back then after Christmas, what more is there to do? I hear you ask. Well, the answer is, and here's a bit of a clue. By the way, this is a cartoon by the uh, cartoonist Tom Gould. He does some fantastic uh, cartoons. I really like the work that he does. But this is about language change, increases the size of his head. This is language change. So this is looking at how and why language changes across time and across the world. So we're looking at these sorts of concepts. This is a fascinating area of the course. We look at the Englishes of the world. Yes, a plural concept, Englishes. Because on the one hand, we have L1 English, that's English as a native language. That's, for example, speakers in the USA and New Zealand and Canada and South Africa, etc. But then you have more, uh, in terms of population, more speakers of English as an L2 language than you have L1. So I'm talking about like speakers of English in places like Nigeria or the Philippines where English is used as a kind of official language. And if you're studying, for example, at high school or at university, then it's high likely that um, you're going to be reading and writing and speaking in English. OK, so we look at the different forms of Englishes across the world. We look at uh, the concept of semantic change. That's the idea that words change in their meaning over time. So you might take a, an adjective like gay, for example, and you might be looking at how that word is being used across all sorts of different texts over time and trying to, to come to some kind of conclusion about what processes are going on there and why is it that words change over time. So that's an interesting area to look at. We look at things like the inkhorn controversy. So this is really about attitudes to language. So this goes back to the 16th and 17th century, the early Renaissance period, when new words are pouring into the lexicon from uh, French and from Italian. And you've got grumpy complainers who are saying, why on earth do we need these new pretentious words coming into the language? Why can't we just stick with our good old English? 
Okay, so that's the Incon controversy. It's um, an interesting area in terms of attitudes to English. So we look at those sorts of things. We look at standard English, where this idea of standard English comes from and how standard English, the concept of standard English, kind of goes through historical stages. Okay, and then we look at different forms of English across the world, like, for example, Indian English. How is Indian English different to British English and why is it so different? And we look at grammatical change as well. So we look at things like changes in syntax and ch changes in morphology. So there's a lot to get stuck into there. And it's a fascinating area. And some of you, going back to the language investigation, some of you might want to pick up on sort of language change ideas on your language investigations. Okay, uh, that takes us all through the Easter term. Now, whilst that is happening, on a Friday, we're doing English Extra. Okay, so the idea is that on a Friday, what we're doing is we're revising all of the stuff which you've forgotten from year one. So we're going back to uh, term one where you were looking at the language levels, you were looking at context, and you were thinking about how meanings and representations come out of texts. So we do some revision about that. We, of course, need to be revising about language diversity because it may well be that you've only got a sketchy recollection of things like language and age and the theorists to do with language and gender. So we obviously need to go back to that. And the language discourses thing, which you've been working on over the last few weeks, that obviously needs a lot of practice over time because it's very important that you're keeping reading lots of journalistic pieces about language and doing some analysis about them. Okay, so if you are frightened that you're thinking, well, I've come to the end of year one and I've forgotten everything, we will be spending Fridays doing this English extra in order to help you recollect those things. Okay, so the second year is really interesting. Now then, here's a bit of a test then. Okay, so I'm going to put five questions on here. Grab a piece of paper for yourself and try and answer these questions. Here we go. Number one, what is the first topic we will be covering in August? Number two, write down two theorists' names from the CLD reading and writing topic. Three, give three possible examples of language investigations. Number four, what's the topic area which we'll be covering after Christmas? And then finally, apart from eating fish and chips, what happens on a Friday? So pause the video there and write your answers. Okay, good. Right, well, I'm not going to go through the answers because I've just all you need to do is rewind the video on there. Let's now go on to uh, getting ready over the summer. Let's have a think about the summer and what you can be doing. Who's this bloke? No, it's not Jeremy Corbyn. It's he of the memes, Michael Rosen. Now, uh, on the course so far, you will have listened to some of these word of mouth programs with Michael Rosen. So this is on BBC iPlayer. It's called Word of Mouth, and they are half hour episodes on all aspects of language. And they really are fantastic. And what we've got here is a list of ones which link in to things that we're doing next year. So, for example, how do children develop language? Well, there you are, CLD. Uh, Frenchified, the influence of French on English. So that's to do with language change. Like Totally Awesome, the Americanization of English. Again, that's to do with language change, etc., etc. So those are really good ones to listen to. So get them on your phone as an app. Listen to them as podcasts while you're doing some kind of mindless chore or even doing your daily exercise. I really recommend it. Okay, so the first thing to do is to listen to those word of mouth half hour episodes. Uh, there's some YouTube watching to do, you'll be pleased to know. Uh, do, do you recognize this fella here? You probably don't, it looks quite old school. This is a chap called Melvin Bragg. Now Melvin Bragg uh, produced a series called The Adventure of English, which is eight 50 minute programs which chart the development of English from its humble Germanic roots to its position as a global lingua franca. 
uh, it's quite a conventional kind of run through of how English has developed over time. Uh, they're very good programs. They're really good. Uh, perhaps you wouldn't be sitting down and watching the, it from you know start to end, but it's a really good set of programs that you can dip into. So I'd really recommend that as a good starting point for understanding about language change. A second YouTube thing uh, to be watching, this guy here, you may recognize him. He's an American psychologist called Pinker, Stephen Pinker, a comparatively colorful linguist. <laughs> That's a joke. And here it is, language as a window on the brain. So this is a 50 minute YouTube video by Stephen Plinker in which he's talking about the complexities of English. And this is important. Uh, it links in with CLD, Children's Language Development. That's a side on picture, by the way, of Stephen Pinker's head with his hair shorn off. Mm. And here is Anne Curzon. So this is an American tutor called Anne Curzon, who talks about all sorts of uh, disparate language issues. There are about 40 of these four minute clips where she introduces language issues. OK, so three things to watch on YouTube. Melvin Bragg, The Adventures of English, Stephen Pinker, Language is a Window on the Brain, and Anne Curzon, The Word on Language and Grammar. OK, and what about some reading? Well, what I do is I'd recommend that you go on to e-magazine. I don't know whether you've been you've got onto the e-magazine site before, but if you uh, put into old Google e-magazine, um, which is run by the English and Media Centre, and you put in that username, all lowercase e-magazine123, password English123, what you're going to find is a veritable treasure trove of archive uh, material about uh, um, language, English language, and of course, English literature. Okay, so you're going to find various ex excellent articles on children's language acquisition, language change, and international English. It's a really good place to go into. Um, and the great thing about it is that those articles are specifically written for you lot. It's for 16 to 18 year olds who are studying A level. So it's different from a lot of the material that you get floating around the internet, which is either for undergraduates or postgraduates, or it's kind of dumbed down for non linguists. This stuff is specifically for you. Okay. And I'd particularly recommend it if you're somebody who's also studying literature as well. Okay. So have a look on e magazine to see what articles that there are on language issues. Um, the other thing I'd say is that since we've been doing about discourses, then you need to keep that going. So get the Guardian app on your phone, which is free. Go into the Mind Your Language section, and there you're going to find quite a good collection of different pieces of writing here about language matters. So I came on this recently, and I came across uh, articles like Winning Words, Franken Words, uh, Oi, Yes, Use Lot. Uh, Lytotes, the most common rhetorical device you've never heard of, etc., etc. So uh, read journalism anyway, but that that uh, particular area is good because those are all articles which are about language features. And finally, the last piece of reading to do, and this is kind of like the most obvious, but possibly the most important, is your good old. Yes, English language AQA textbook. Uh, I have taught many English courses over the years, and I have to say that this is the best textbook that I've ever used in terms of it being kind of all inclusive and student friendly. So it would be a great idea for you to be reviewing all of the work covered so far. So I'm talking about looking at that opening section where it introduces aspects of context and then the language levels. Um, look at the whole chapter, which is about uh, uh, varieties and representations. Um, and then, of course, you've got the chapter which starts round about page 145, I think, from memory, which takes you through language diversity. OK, look, it's perfectly normal to forget things, certainly on my behalf. It's normal to forget things. So the best thing that you can do is just to be rereading parts of the textbook. 
so that you get to recall the stuff that we have covered earlier on in the course. So I'm talking about things like language and occupation and language and gender and language and age, those sorts of things. And of course, you can get ahead of the game because it's got a great chapter here about CLD, about children's language development and about language change. So of all of the things that I've said so far, you know, really sitting down and having a program of rereading your English language AQA textbook is possibly the most efficient way to really get ahead in the subject. Okay, so in summary, here we go over the summer, because you have got something like six or seven weeks. These are the things I'll be asking you to do. Word of mouth, have a listen to some episodes that's to do with language change and CLD. Watch Melvin Bragg, The Adventure of English. Uh, look at Stephen Pinker's Language is a Window on the Brain and have a look at Anne Curzon's The Word on Language and Grammar. Get into e-magazine and try and have a look at some of the articles that are on there. Make sure that you're regularly reading some journalism. We're recommending The Guardian, Mind Your Language site. And this is so important that I've put it in red with three exclamation marks, the AQA English Language Textbook. Keep in touch with your teacher. Remember what I said about trying to finish everything off at the end of this term so that you haven't got stuff lingering over into the summer holiday. We will be kept busy. We'll be writing reports about you, of course. You also need to be thinking about UCAS and possible university courses that you might want to, be, want to go on to, should you wish to progress in that way. And all I'm gonna say is have a great summer and I can't wait to see all of you when we reappear in the middle of August. Have a great summer. Thank you. Bye-bye.